Well, I'm thrilled to be here today uh, and participate in an event that covers one of the hottest topics in the technology industry. With more than half of all Americans carrying a smartphone, mobile transactions are a big part of our day-to-day -day lives. The growth of the mobile industry has transformed our economy to focus on digital commerce. The mobile market share is estimated to be about 31 billion by 2016, with the potential to expand to tens of trillions of dollars. All that gives consumers and businesses unprecedented purchasing power at their fingertips. Our three national experts will share with us exactly how each one of their companies are leading developments within the mobile payments sector. I'd like to ask our esteemed panelists to join me on stage as we begin today's program. Ladies and gentlemen, these are three of the most well-respected individuals who are revolutionizing this sector. Ben Milne. <laughs> Ben Milne is the founder and CEO of Dewalla, one of the hottest cashless start payment startups in the country. He is also listed on Inc. Magazine's most recent list of top 30 entrepreneurs under 30. Chris Tiso is the founder of Chirpify, one of the newest payment platforms to hit the scene. He will show us exactly not only how, how to, make purchase and to purchase items via Twitter, but also how to use the social network to make more complicated microtransactions that we face every day, like splitting up lunch tabs or bar tabs. And Barb Pacheco is Senior Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. She's leading research in the bank's National Payments Division, and she will tell us exactly how the bank interacts with payment companies like Dewalla and Chirpify. Chris is our first presenter today, and as the, founder, as the former founder of an interactive services provider and product incubator, he has a wealth of experience building and coaching digital startups. Today, he's the founder and CEO of Chirpify, which is transforming Twitter into a so-called conversational commerce platform. And if you aren't sure exactly what that means, don't worry. We'll see exactly how Chirpify interacts with Twitter during Chris's live demo. Please join me in welcoming Chris to the podium. Hello, Casey. Thank you very much for having me here. Let me just adjust this. So I'm Chris Tiso. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Tropify. As uh, Ben mentioned, my 15-year pass is in interactive advertising. And so apparently, and I did not know this, but uh, that eventually makes you a payments expert. So you know, I'm just happy to be here. Um, about a year and a half ago, I started working on Chirpify, and four months ago, we launched publicly. In those four months, in the last four months, we raised a Series A round of financing, and I hired six brilliant people uh, to be on my team. And so it's been a busy four months. We're the, a startup in the truest sense. We're located in Portland, Oregon, which I've heard has similar uh, startup ecosystem to KC which is great because it's uh, exploding in Portland, so I'm sure uh, things are good here as well. Um, the impetus for Chirpify, uh, I noticed that a lot of people were going to different marketplaces and listing items for sale, and then they'd go to Twitter and they'd tweet about them. And essentially, they were creating a broadcast ad, and this broadcast ad, they hoped to lure people away from Twitter to eventually go through a six-step checkout process and eventually transact. I found this to be inefficient. I thought, well, you know, if, if you're doing this, why can't we combine the two? Um, you can list an item for sale on Twitter, and what if people could buy it in stream without linking off um, purchasing right on Twitter? So I combine the two. I drink your milkshakes. My wife told me not to do my Daniel Day-Lewis impression, so I held off on that. So what is Chirpify today? Uh, today, we enable consumers, nonprofits, politicians, musicians, record labels, uh, brands uh, to buy, sell, donate, and transact in stream on Twitter. And so, where the concept was truly like Etsy or Craigslist on Twitter, it evolved. I said, well, if people are willing to sell their bike on Twitter, then Best Buy is going to want to sell on Twitter. And if you can do that, you can do peer to peer payments on Twitter, and you can do donations on Twitter. And so these, these transactions are social, so you know, they're all public. Um, you can even transact with a retweet, so they have that viral aspect. They're device agnostic, so we're at a mobile payments conference. So um, this works on mobile, it works on desktop, it works on a tablet. 
they're frictionless. They're one step. And so what do I mean by that? I mean we're using something we're calling conversational commerce or natural language transactions. And so when you tweet something like pay or a command like donate or buy or gimme, we can make a transaction happen in the background. And so who's using this and how are they using it? One of our biggest verticals so far is music. And so the ability for musicians to control their own distribution, to leverage the follower account that they've built up on Twitter. Here's Moses Stone, and he's listing his uh, latest track. He's dropping his latest track on Twitter. And it's um, my latest single, My Moment. Um, here's how you buy. Replied buy to purchase for $1.50. And so when a consumer sees that in their Twitter stream, or someone retweeted it and they want the track, they just reply with the word buy. We make a transaction happen in the background, and the MP3 is delivered via DM right to the consumer. And so it's fulfillment, purchasing, um, enlisting, all wrapped up in two tweets, essentially. We have VH1 and other nonprofits using it to collect donations in stream on Twitter. We have political organizations. And so at the top tweet, you can see um, they did a di direct donation to Barack Obama. The bottom tweet, you can see JR is running for Congress, and he's using it to uh, raise campaign funds for his election. And then we have peer-to-peer -peer payments, and we have thousands of people using Chirpify to split a bill, to pay for a beer, to pay each other back for rent, to pay me because I hate PowerPoint, to buy a friend a burrito, to pay for Coachella tickets. And lastly, we have brands, and brands are using this in peculiar ways. And one of these is uh, Sir Richards is using it to sell condoms. And, you know, would you buy a condom in a public forum on Twitter? People have. And then they go and they, they tweet about it afterwards. And this is important. <laughs> Not because condoms, you know, condoms are obviously important, but besides that. It's important because people are willing to share and don't underestimate what they'll share. They purchased it in a public forum, and then they went and tweeted out about it. Hey, I bought a condom on Twitter. And so I'll, I'll hop into a demo. And so this is a live demo. Um, we're on Twitter.com, and you can see we're signed in as our consumer demo. And the quickest, easiest way to show you um, is just to pay someone. So let's pay. Our Chirp brand demo, $5 for showing off. And when I tweet that, there's no other steps. I just paid Chirp brand demo. I transferred $5 to his account. It's totally frictionless, as I said. If Chirp brand demo was not a member of Chirpify and we weren't monitoring his Twitter stream, um, we pick up on that anyways. And we'd reply to Chirp brand demo and say, hey, consumer demo is trying to pay you $5, but you haven't signed up yet come do that. And they'd get a response right back over Twitter. And when they landed on Chirpify.com, they'd sign up, the transaction would process, and then they'd never have to come back to Chirpify again. They can do this entirely in stream with one tweet on Twitter. And see, uh, we just get a direct message back from our Tripify account that is actually a robot um, that responded and said, hey, your payment was successful. Um, Trip ran demo received the $5. If we go over to Trip ran demo's dashboard on Tripify, the dashboard is a place where it holds all your receipts. And so you see we instantly have a receipt from consumer demo, and this is what they paid you for, direct payment received. Dashboard also allows you to sell items on Twitter, start a fundraiser, um, modify your preferences. And so we're signed in as Chirp Brand Demo, but it's actually Radiohead. And so Radiohead is dropping their latest track on Twitter. If we open the listing tweet, you can see there's a preview of that up top. So grab our latest track and download on Twitter, reply buy to purchase for a dollar. If we change the price to zero, you can see that that changed the verb. So now the verb is gimme. And so you can run giveaways um, and give away digital content directly on Twitter. People reply gimme. The digital content is delivered the same way as if they bought it. So we'll leave that at a dollar. You can control quantity. So if you're selling a physical item or um, people are using this to sell quantity-sensitive items, so backstage passes, 
uh, you can list this as three, whatever you want. If you sell out of those instantly on Twitter, we'll go out in the ecosystem and remove all the tweets that reference this listing. So no one's out there trying to buy something that no longer exists. So it's truly inventory control. They've already uploaded their digital content. We, we support, you can upload up to a gig of digital concert, uh, content. So digital tickets, um, MP3s, PDFs, EPUB files, um, you name it, videos. You can upload a photo, you can set it on a tweet schedule, so you can say I want to tweet this out automatically every four hours, keep it fresh in people's streams. And lastly, you can customize your tweet text. And so we've already done that. Grab our latest track, download on Twitter. You tweet it out, and we can go to Twitter again and see exactly what that listing looks like. This is, you know, again, we're signed in as our consumer, and this is Radiohead dropping their latest track, and you're following Radiohead and you want this because um, that's why people follow brands or famous people on Twitter is because they want the latest stuff. So I want to buy this. And I'll just say reply, buy. And that's it. There is no checkout process. There is no shopping cart. The whole idea was to eliminate that stuff and make it as simple as possible. What's the easiest way you could make a payment? What's the easiest way you could buy something? Um, and that's exactly what this is. Again, if um, Consumer Demo wasn't a member of Chirpify and they attempted to buy something, we'd uh, pick that up automatically as well. We'd respond to them and say, hey, looks like you're trying to buy this MP3 from Radiohead, but you're not a member, come sign up. So if we refresh this again, I go to my direct messages. You can see, congrats, you purchased this listing. Here's the MP3. So you instantly get a download link back. That download link is totally secure. It's gated to your Twitter account. No one else can access it. Um, and so we do CDN as well. And that is the demo. So let me hop back into my, my PowerPoint here again. And so what are some emerging trends that we see when this happens? It's something new, you know, it's social, it's payments, it's social payments. So, seeing some interesting things emerge as, as these take off. And one of them is uh, social payments integrated into marketing campaigns. And this is an example tweet from Tweetabeer. And Tweetabeer is an application built for South by Southwest. It was built off our API. We have a really robust API. Anything you can do uh, through Chirpify, you can do with the API. And so I'll just show you what Tweetabeer, what occurred with Tweetabeer when they added social payments. Tweet a beer. Tweet a beer. Tweet a beer. An app that allows you to send your beer drinking buddy a beer quickly and easily over the internet. You can now buy any of your Twitter pals a drink via Tweet a beer. The Twitter app basically allows you to send five bucks to a friend or a stranger across the bar. You and the recipient need to have a PayPal and Sherpify account. They we're going to be doing a lot of drinking, so the idea was create a little app that will make it easy to not only send money for someone to get a beer, but you tell them where you are. If you're living in New York City, then maybe it can only buy you half a pint. Yeah, I'll get it to you immediately. Okay. Company 10-4 is launching Tweet a Beer. Tweet a Beer comes from two Portland companies, Wagner, Edstrom, and 10-4.
so you can see it's a whimsical um, app that was launched at South by. Um, but it was a perfect kind of, you know, we had just launched, it was a perfect intro to the world of how easy this is. And, you know, during South by, we saw 1,500 beers being sold every night of South by Southwest. Got picked up all over the place. So interesting things happen when you integrate social payments with a marketing campaign. Another thing we see emerging is uh, social payments as rewards. And this is really interesting because uh, for years, people have been giving kudos over Twitter or um, you know, tweeting stuff at their friends. And what we've seen is people are starting to attach money to this. And it's kind of a social, you know, this is all public, so it's kind of a social validation or kudos with an actual monetary value attached to it. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and so you see examples of this. Um, paying Denver Egotist uh, for just doing a good job. We see um, Eric Benson paying, um, you know, he has a really cool father-in-law worth $10 to him. We see Rick Calero um, paying someone just being a good dude. And I myself um, have done this many times, so I paid David Marcus, the president of PayPal, for a great talk. And you guys can feel free to pay me later for this great talk. Um, the antithesis of this is we've also seen um, social payments as shaming. And so Beeminder is a company out of Portland who's also using our API. And Beeminder has a really interesting model. They allow you to um, track progress towards goals. And along these goals, you set milestones. And they're betting that you're going to fail these milestones. Because every time you fail a milestone, you have to pay Beeminder. Well, they took it a step further with our API, and when you fail a goal now or a milestone, it automatically tweets out from your account a payment to Beeminder. So all your friends see that you didn't lose five pounds um, on your way to losing 40 over the next month. So they're calling that social shaming. I think that's really interesting as well. So uh, we've seen a lot of things. We fit in a lot of places. We're four months old, so you know, we're new. What is Tripify? Are we a social you know, company? Are we an e-commerce company? Are we a payments company? The answer is we don't know. And it's not that we're rudderless or don't have a plan. That's not why we don't know. It's because the definitions of those words are changing. And so what it means to be an e-commerce shop, what it means to be a platform or a payments company is changing. What we do know is commerce is going to be decentralized. And we're pushing really hard to make this happen. Um, you know, commerce has kind of lived in a centralized location, a marketplace, an online mall. Um, and I think that's going to change. I think listings will live everywhere. Payments will live everywhere. I think it's going to be ubiquitous across the web, on your phone, on different devices. You see what's happening, what we're doing on Twitter. You're going to see similar things on Pinterest. Um, items live across the web and are accessible everywhere. Payments are being simplified. Everyone and their mother is working on this. So big players like Google, um, we, we're working on it. Um, you know, Dwala's working on it. Everyone's working on simplifying payments. We want it to be easy. I actually want them to disappear into the background. I want it so you're buying something, you don't have to think about it. It just happens. Social is eating everything. And so everything's moving to social media. Um, we want to be on the cusp of that. Uh, again, I think all listings and commerce, that's eventually going to be baked into social media where you can transact wherever you are across the web using different social identities. And lastly, cash won't exist. The definition of what a bank is is changing. And, you know, cash doesn't exist. Money or numbers just move around the cloud now. And so I can chirp you $10. And you can take that $10 uh, and go into a Home Depot and buy a shovel with it. Did you ever have the money? Did it exist? Is it cash? Did it move right through you to Home Depot? Um, those are all interesting questions. I think um, Barb from the Fed will probably touch on that, the movement of money and how that's changing. And so what is Tripify going to become? We'd like to be on the cusp of, cusp of all of these. So we think we can um, become kind of an open ID for payments. So, uh, we'll combine all your social identities, we'll combine various payment platforms, and then we'll make that portable. So wherever you go on the web, we can make payments as easy as possible. Thank you.
Thank you, Chris. And, uh, no, this I think that there's uh, a couple of interesting things that Chris's company does that really you guys have probably all picked up on. Uh, one is sort of the brand echo effect. I mean, when you have somebody out there who's buying something and attaching a brand name for it, and we can all see, uh, then buying becomes popular. And it'll be neat to kind of see how that plays out. Uh, I know that he's also uh, going to enable people to buy via direct message. So if you have a few geekier items that you don't want people to see, or you don't want to mainstream, uh, you know, you can always do that uh, on Chirpify too. Um, and there's also sort of the, the, the psychological aspect of what happens when you're buying in bits or bytes uh, versus buying with paper dollars. Um, there's a couple good examples he's had there about how altruism works uh, with folks seeing far, seeming far more ready to actually help each other out and uh, give money uh, you know, when it's done virtually, which I think is a really interesting concept. Um, our next speaker brings more than 20 years of experience to the banking and payment industries. Barb Pacheco is Senior Vice President uh, and the member of the Management Committee of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. She heads the Financial Services Division of the bank, which provides payments and services to support financial institutions across the United States. She's also responsible for the bank's Payments System Research Group, which is what brings her here today. If you could all please welcome me in joining, joining Barb in, in welcoming Barb to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, this is a, a great opportunity uh, for me uh, to be with, with this group on, on this panel and talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is the payment system. Um, thank you. Uh, to Casey Next and Ryan Weber for envir inviting me. I really appreciate that. Um, pleased to have an opportunity to do uh, a few things for you this afternoon. One is tell you a little bit about the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, who we are, what we do. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the retail payments landscape. And when I talk about retail payments, I'm, I'm talking about checks and where that's been and where it's going. Um, the ACH, or Automated Clearinghouse, uh, the networks that, that sit behind all of the innovation that, that you're hearing uh, about today and actually uh, make things work. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And then I also want to talk about where the consumer fits into this. Uh, our payments research group in Kansas City has done a lot of good work. In, in studying the demand side of, of payments, and I, I hope to uh, uh, kind of fill you in on, on a little bit about what happens behind the scenes and, and how it works, uh, and talk about how the new methods of making payments compare to some of the traditional methods that we have. So let me start with uh, a little bit about who we are. Um, so. So your company, Chris, started uh, four months ago. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City opened for business almost 100 years ago. Uh, we're located uh, up the hill uh, near Liberty Memorial, moved into that building in 2008. Uh, we've got uh, four bran three branches, one in Denver, Oklahoma City, and Omaha, serving the, the 10th Federal Reserve District of, of financial institutions. We've got about 1,400 employees, and um, more and more over that 100-year history, and, and particularly in the last 10, we've become a, a technology-oriented organization, and, and probably more than 40% of our employees are involved in technology development, providing uh, services, supporting uh, our technology infrastructure uh, for our, our three missions. And, I want to talk about those missions briefly, um, monetary policy, um, bank supervision uh, and regulation, and third, uh, what the Federal Reserve does in the payment system. And we sometimes refer to these three miss missions as, as a three-legged stool, all supporting financial stability and, and economic growth. Um, let me talk about the payments mission in particular, because that'll lead into the rest of, of my comments. You know, our job uh, and the reason the payment system is, is so important um, is we're handling uh, every day 
um, several trillion dollars of value of payments that uh, individuals and businesses and financial institutions are relying on to be done um, very efficiently uh, with a lot of safety and security uh, and resiliency built in, uh, and also that we provide broad access so that you know, a, a business in Northwest Kansas has as much access and opportunity uh, to access the payment system as uh, an organization or a company in, in New York City. So, um, so our job in payments is, is three-pronged and it very much is supporting uh, the, the goals of financial stability and economic growth. Um, how do we do this? Uh, the 12 reserve banks uh, located across the country uh, are one of the biggest operators uh, within the payment system today. We connect more than 10,000 financial institutions, banks, thrifts, credit unions, uh, so they can transfer and exchange payments with one another. Um, and, and so, so we're a, a major participant in the payment system, um, but we also are, uh, operate in the role of a leader or a catalyst for change. So, for example, um, seeing the opportunity to take the paper check where, you know, we, we invest a lot of people and transportation to handle checks, process them, route them all across the country, um, saw an opportunity to, to electro, electronify the check process, uh, worked with the industry to figure out what the best way to do that was, uh, worked with people in Congress to uh, remove a legal barrier so that we don't have to rely on a physical piece of paper to complete the payments process. And, and when that uh, took place, we were able to really move into the, the digital age of, of, of checks. Um, finally, I'll mention the Board of Governors uh, in Washington, D.C. as part of the Federal Reserve System, um, and in addition to their responsibility in overseeing each of the 12 reserve banks, they also have a responsibility for uh, overseeing and, and playing a regulatory role in, in the payment system. Uh, moving uh, on to give you a little bit of a high level view of what's going on in the payment system, you know, one of the uh, benefits and value that we, we provide is, is to do research uh, and share that research with the industry. Uh, we have done uh, a series of studies of the non-cash retail payment system, and this chart shows uh, four studies that we've done since 2000 through 2009 showing the trend in the volume of payments, uh, payments made by check, which you can see is declining precipitously from 2000 through 2009. Uh, this chart shows the growth of the debit card uh, and how popular that's, that's become as a, as a mechanism to, uh, to make payments. It shows the growth of the automated clearinghouse, the ACH system, that uh, is, is a lot of the backbone behind some of the new payments innovation and how the actual funds get, get transferred, and I'll talk a little bit about that. One of the interesting things, though, about where we are today in the payment system is even though we're not using checks nearly as much as we did uh, 10 years ago, for person-to-person -person payments um, and even for business payments to suppliers, check is still relied on very heavily. Uh, and so the question becomes, you know, how can this innovation that we've been talking about uh, how does it hold up against the tried and true traditional methods of, of making payments? So we'll talk about that in, in a little bit more detail. Um, this next slide uh, comes from some research that uh, was done, uh, survey research from the Pew Research Center on how pervasive smartphones are today among the adult population. And they took 
this, this shows two data points um, from May of 2011 to February of 2012, and nearly half of adults now carry a smartphone. Uh, and the penetration for those under 35 is even higher at about 70%. Um, we're all using our smartphones for a variety of things, but do we use them very much for payments activity yet? And, and the survey data shows, you know, not so much. Uh, maybe 11% of, of adults have, have made payments with, with smartphones. Um, but the fact that adults are carrying these devices and connect with their banks, their providers, their uh, coffee store of choice um, really suggests that mobile payments do have the potential to, to grow over time. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the various uh, capabilities that the smartphone gives us to uh, do payments. Um, until recently, primarily they were devices that would allow us to um, look at information, to track our balances, uh, not so much for making payments, but today companies like Square and Intuit provide merchants the ability to accept credit cards where they uh, didn't have that uh, ability before with their mobile phones. Um, Starbucks uh, offers arguably one of the most popular mo mobile payment applications uh, where, you know, based on a, a prepaid or a, a stored value uh, card, um, the mobile phone allows retailers, now they're beginning to experiment with shopping in the aisle and can we complete the payments transaction uh, right there in the aisle instead of at, uh, at the cashier register. Um, and mobile check deposit is becoming more popular as, as financial institutions begin to offer that uh, convenience to customers. Um, so a lot of technology, a lot of capabilities, um, but the question is, are consumers ready to, to change their behavior? Um, one of the uh, uh, areas of research that our payments research group does is on, on consumer payments demand barriers. And uh, one of our economists published an article in our economic review uh, earlier this year they really looked at some, some particularly important attributes of, of a payment. What, what comes with a payment method? So things like convenience and having control over how you initiate a payment um, or how you are able to monitor your finances. And mobile payments generally um, is a positive factor for those two attributes. Um, the acceptance of payments, though, is probably a, a feature that um, will be holding back adoption for a period of time. You know, to the extent you have the ability to, to initiate a payment, but the receiver doesn't have the ability to receive that payment, um, that's going to be a big factor. So, uh, particularly as compared to uh, check or cash for person-to-person -person payments, that, that's going to be an issue. It'll also be an issue at the merchant point of sale until those devices are, are capable of uh, accepting mobile payments. And then finally, certain uh, attributes with, with uncertain impact on, on consumer uh, adoption of, of mobile payments. Um, as I mentioned, Many, many consumers now have smartphones, um, some of which are, are enabled uh, for payments and so for certain type of payment methods. Uh, but some consumers, uh, cost will be an issue. Um, the security, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, um, security with mobile payments uh, is, is a developing area. And if there's one thing that I could ask of the technology innovators, it's, it's really to put uh, a lot more thought into how we can secure uh, payments in a mobile payments environment. Uh, the, the technology provides some, 
some great ways to strengthen security compared to certain other methods like the check. Uh, but consumers are, are, are a little bit worried uh, about security in terms of, of adopting uh, mobile payments. And then finally, uh, targeted ads and promotion. And this is an uncertain area too. Uh, on the one hand, consumers may like to share a lot of, of information about themselves, uh, which might get them benefits in terms of, of promotions from, from companies that they're doing business with. Um, but in another sense, uh, consumers are also concerned about privacy issues. Um, one, one other study I'll, I'll mention, and this is a, an upcoming article um, that will be published in our economic review in the, in the third quarter, is around how these new payment uh, methods for person-to-person -person payments compare to uh, checks. And um, again, uh, the similar type of, of attributes we're looking at. So uh, the convenience, the speed of the payment, uh, how much control does the initiator of the payment have with these new methods, uh, the security, and then the universal acceptance. So I'll use uh, an illustration to kind of highlight uh, some of the benefits and then some of the gaps involved with person-to-person -person payments. Um, this is an example of uh, a PayPal uh, transaction. So on the bottom of the slide below the line, you see a, a, a PayPal account holder that wants to initiate a, a payment and uh, instructs PayPal that they want to make a payment um, to a particular email address or mobile account number. Um, the example assumes that uh, the payer or the receiver wants, uh, or the payer wants to extract the funds from their bank account um, and uh, send the funds to the receiver's bank account. Um, most of the new person-to-person -person payment methods make it relatively easy for customers to manage their finances um, by speeding up the processing of the payment. So in this PayPal example, the payee doesn't have to wait until a check arrives in, in order to learn about the payment. There's an immediate notification uh, of the payment. Um, also, since payment processing doesn't have to wait until that check arrives, uh, the settlement, the final completion of, of the payment is faster. Um, and then finally, uh, there's, there's no exchange between the individuals of what bank account or what account number uh, the payer needs to send the payment to. Uh, that information is shared with the provider of the person-to-person -person payment method, so with, with PayPal in this example. Um, so looking at it um, compared to uh, other, other payment methods, um, settlement may be faster than for check payments, but still not as fast as it could be. In, in this example, um, there are actually two transactions happening above the line uh, where PayPal's bank is instructing uh, the payer's bank to um, withdraw funds from the payer's account, and at the same time, or subsequent, PayPal's bank is instructing uh, through the ACH, the payee's bank, uh, to accept a credit. Uh, so we've got two transactions, we've got a day or so or more of a, of a delay, um, and both the payer and the payee have to be signed up uh, in order to make this happen as quick as, as it can. If the receiver is not signed up with PayPal, they do get a message saying, we've got funds for you, but then they have to go through a process of, of signing up, which can add additional delays to the process. So we've got a, a fragmented uh, system as, as all these various new pay, pay, payment methods try to capture the attention of, of consumers for person-to-person -person payments. So here's a, uh, an example of uh, a bank based method for person-to-person -person payments. Um, what you have in, in this example 
is uh, the initiator of the payment logging on to their online, ki online banking site um, with the knowledge of the payee's uh, mobile phone number uh, and instructing their bank to initiate a funds transfer, a credit through the automated clearinghouse in this example, uh, to the, the receiver's bank. Well, how do they know where the receiver bank is? This example introduces the concept of a directory which would be available and accessible to all financial institutions. So when the payer's bank gets the instruction to make a payment to the receiver, um, the, payer, the payer bank can uh, go to the directory, find out what receiver bank that that payee does business with, complete the ACH transaction, uh, and goes through uh, in that way. So one of, one of the, the benefits of this arrangement is that financial institutions have an ability through the ACH network, for example, or other networks to be connected to one another to handle that transfer of funds that has to take place. And second, that the sharing of that very private information about where you bank and what your account number is, is uh, maintained by a trusted entity within this uh, service. Now the question, the policy question of who's that trusted entity I think is an important one. Uh, and along with other policy questions is uh, our areas that, that we've been thinking about at the Kansas City Fed. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up very quickly with, with this slide. We, we hosted a conference uh, uh, involving a number of leading industry people, academics, policymakers from the U.S. and around the world uh, to learn a little bit more about um, what are the barriers to innovation like this actually taking place, uh, to really look at some of the risk and security issues involved in introducing uh, mobile payments uh, and, and other alternate uh, ways of, of making payments. Um, looking at the access issues with the unbanked and, and underbanked. Uh, and finally, you know, what can we as policymakers at the, at the Fed or, or other policymakers do to support the infrastructure that allows the innovation that's taking place close to consumers and close to businesses uh, really have uh, good benefits going forward. Um, with that, I'm going to conclude here. Um, I've included a whole list of uh, publications and books that our research group has, has put together uh, and just invite you, if, if you're interested, uh, to go to kansascityfed.org um, and, and see what we have to offer. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Barb. Uh, I think one of the things that's really interesting to think about uh, when we're talking about speeding up the rate of transactions, and I think Ben will probably get into this in, in just a minute, but is the amount of time and wastage that you eliminate. Uh, when the Fed went to, uh, from paper checks having to be physically moved from place to place in 2004 to their digital imaging, uh, they were able to eliminate more than 50 million bits of paper that were transplanted by, transported by airplanes daily to different institutions from 10,000 uh, different financial institutions. Um, and that was a savings of basically billions in infrastructure costs. So there's benefits for everybody in the system uh, as things speed up. And before we introduce our third speaker, uh, I'd like to remind everyone to text BANK uh, to 74574 for your chance to win home run derby tickets. That's taking place tonight at Kauffman Stadium. And our final speaker is a payments outsider. He's the founder of Dewala, which is the next generation payment network. And uh, he's a repeat entrepreneur. Uh, ben Milne built his first international company at the age of 19, turning a $1,200 investment into a multi-million dollar online speaker company. Um, and at that point, he became obsessed with traditional card fees, uh, in part because they were affecting his own profit margins. So he sold the company in 2008 uh, to focus on Dewala full-time. 
Uh, Ben's been named to Forbes and Inc.'s top 30 under 30 lists. And Ashton Kutcher just joined Dawala's portfolio as an investor this year. Let's welcome Ben Milne to the podium. Thanks, man. Is there a clicker up there? Cool. Hey, everybody. Thanks for that. Uh, where's everybody from? Is everybody from Kansas City? Yeah? All right. That makes me feel good. From Des Moines, obviously. Um, my name is Ben Milne. Um, I'm not really anything by trade. I'm a college dropout. Um, I build stuff. I built one company before Douala, and now I'm concentrating on Douala. Um, my kind of current obsession is Douala, and I'm kind of collectively choosing that this is what I want to do with the next three, five, ten years of my life, really however long it takes. And the thing that I've been working on is kind of how do we, one, make payments more efficient? How do we make payments um, safer? I think that the way we currently move money right now um, feels a little bit strange. I think there's kind of a payment stack that most people don't ever know about, me included, when I started. And there's a lot of, thing around, a lot of things around it that um, we don't realize. Um, I definitely didn't. Um, a good question. How many people have a credit card or a debit card in their pocket? So obviously, it affects all of us. Um, what I think that we forget is that things like the ACH system end up moving all of our money. Um, so this thing moves like $30 trillion plus a year. Not a lot of bigger markets than that. And um, that's kind of what we care about at Dwell is how we can leverage the internet to create new efficiencies in the marketplace that actually have not only an effect possibly on our entire economy, but then how we can take that technology and actually connect it to global markets. Um, we think that the evolution of kind of um, from analog to digital represents a huge opportunity that hasn't really been um, capitalized yet in the payments world. Um, everybody's really been building on top of the existing stack. So if you think about PayPal or you think about really anything, and it's unfair to pigeonhole PayPal, we all do it. Um, when you guys go online, you put in your debit card or credit card to buy something, would you say that's fair? So when you make that purchase, your money is less valuable because you exchanged it. Does that seem illogical to you? So it seems very illogical to me, and it's my feeling that if the current architecture actually makes money less valuable as it's exchanged, um, that's not necessarily a good thing. And so we look at the world like it needs a different architecture to move money. And, sorry, um, we think that has a lot to do not necessarily with making payments uh, easier on the top of the stack. So what you're kind of putting in Twitter, um, which is, is amazing. And I think that like those things will continue to allow us to acquire the things we want more quickly, which is very important. But the bottom of the stack is really where I think a lot of the value can be. And at the end of the day, your credit cards and debit cards, um, all that money comes out of your bank account. And because of the way that we exchange money, we actually expose ourselves. And the systems themselves aren't exactly all that safe which, again, feels semi-illogical. If those are the systems that are supposed to be the things moving our money, which we work so hard for, you'd think they would want to protect us. Um, so to remove any amount of money from a bank account, all that's really needed is an account number, a routing number, and the ability to issue a request. Nobody needs your permission. Does that freak you out at all? That's not the way the system should work. Every time you make a purchase with your credit card, you're leaving behind data that could be utilized to commit credit card fraud or debit card fraud with your information. And it passes through a whole bunch of other channels that you don't even know exist. They don't even have to tell you they exist, and that's perfectly legal. I think that's a problem. So, you know, I kind of said, how many people have credit cards or debit cards? How many people have experienced identity theft? Those that didn't raise your hand, your identity just hasn't been basically utilized yet. It's already been stolen. So, <laughs> that's, that's not necessarily a good thing, right? And a lot of that has to do with payments architecture. And again, my belief is that the money comes out of your one bank account and it goes to the other. I don't care what the mechanism is that you initiate the payment with, that's how it works. And if there's the opportunity to create a more efficient mechanism in the middle that makes that transaction happen faster, that's where I want to be. And I think that we can make people's lives better, we can reduce costs for entire markets, and we can actually start creating new products and services on top of that, which might even create a own market of its own. Um, again, all the money comes from your bank account, and then it goes to another one. I think 
that's actually how simple payments are. I think that we've made it really complicated just because we continue to build on top and we've made this really incestuous weave of how we're gonna move money and it just keeps adding costs and adding security problems. And security should be baked into the network. So a lot of the things that we're doing now with financial institutions and with um, kind of e-commerce companies and retail companies, we're actually baking security right in. So the ability to actually analyze and stop transactions in real time is an extremely important part of any new system or architecture. And we think that it's something that's really missing from the existing system. Um, you know, I think that we kind of talk a lot about um, the word disruption. Like, how many people are building companies in this room? Some? The rest of you guys, where do you work? Like, spit something out. Sprint. Sprint? All right, big telecom, right? Are they, are, do you think like they're disrupting telecom or like they're being disrupted, right? And in mobile payments, it's probably an interesting conversation because a lot of the telecoms are working really hard in carrier billing. And I think that things like that have an amazing uh, consumer benefit to get people what they want faster, but even carrier billing is extremely expensive. And on the other side, if the money is less valuable because it's exchanged, and it seems illogical to me. Um, and it's even worse in emerging countries like Africa with M-Pesa, where a huge majority of the transaction value is lost in the simple exchange. Um, there's room for improvement. And I just think that um, we're kind of on the attempting to disrupt climb with a smile on our face and trying to see what's next. We don't necessarily know a lot of the assumptions if they're correct. We just have an idea about how we can make something more simple. And we do think payments are ultimately extremely simple because no matter what country you go to, you're receiving value for something that you do. And then you're exchanging it with someone else for something you want. It's very simple. And we just think sticking to that simplicity will serve us really well. So I wanted to put this up just kind of, how many people are familiar with payments? Like how many people are payments geeks in the room? That's way more than usual, by the, by the way. So, I mean, you guys know this stuff. Like in a card transaction, there's a ton of providers in the in-between. And there's nothing wrong with that. They all serve a really amazing purpose. You need merchant accounts, you need merchant acquirers, you need underwriters, you need resellers, you need ISOs, you need, I mean, shit, you need postage so you can mail the cards. I mean, you need so much stuff in the middle that at the end of the day, why do you care about all this stuff? I mean, just, just like you are talking about, all you really care is that you very quickly and efficiently acquire the thing you want. And so all these things are just infrastructure and legacy costs that um, we kind of receive into it so that we can make a payment. And you know, you'll see this kind of slide from me probably multiple times today, but we just stick to the fact that how can we leverage the internet to be able to allow someone to connect to their bank account, which is where they hold their money, and then allow them to exchange that money with someone else who can receive it at a very low cost and pay virtually nothing in order to receive it. On the consumer Dwalla network, basically all payments over $10 cost 25 cents a transaction, regardless of size. All payments under $10 are totally free, and that payment can basically happen inside of any mobile device, any app. Um, it could be inside of Twitter, it could be inside of Facebook, it could be on Dwalla.com, it could be inside of anything. As long as it's connected to the internet, it can basically say, I am here, I want to acquire this. It can pass the authorization and pass the payment. So, I'll kind of go through maybe a little bit of a belabored scenario to make a point. You just like want to acquire what you want. Sometimes that's pizza, sometimes that's, that's beer, sometimes that's a new car, but obviously we always want and need certain things. And it starts with, obviously, we want that thing. And wanting it shouldn't include all this other stuff, in my opinion. I think that all this other stuff ends up basically racking up costs to make the transaction more expensive. And if it exposes the consumer and it's expensive for the merchant, they do something really beautifully, which is it allows you not to carry physical cash, which I think is important, especially as you move toward the electronification of cash. How many, like, does anybody know how much physically a million dollars weighs? I mean, does, I'm kind of almost expecting in this room this one guy is gonna say, oh, blah, 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 X pounds. But it makes me feel good that the answer is no, because no one knows. How much money you have in your bank account is represented by the number of zeros when you log in. That's what money is. Databases are now, or banks are now databases. And I think that there's an opportunity to leverage that and the connectivity of the internet to say, okay, to complete a transaction, maybe we don't need to have the same exact cycle that we've always had. And I realize that it's gonna change a lot of people's business model, but if I'm eating dinner somewhere and I start looking at the actual cost for the pizza place statistically to get paid, 
All of a sudden, if I can give them back their 3.5% margin or even 3% more, I can double how much money they take home because I chose to do business there and I chose to pay this way. And I think that's very powerful. It's powerful for you to be able to pay for something you want really quickly, but if you can kind of accelerate a marketplace and accelerate a business because of how you choose to pay, that's powerful, at least in my opinion. Obviously, I get a little worked up sometimes. I think there are other problems, right? So everything's expensive. Basically, when you go to a debit card and you get physical cash out, you're basically taking this, this virtualized asset personified in this physical device to be able to turn this number in a database into something physical, which is a withdrawal on a bank balance sheet to turn it back into physical cash. So you're now basically paying money to turn your electronic asset into a physical asset, which was removed electronically on a balance sheet. <laughs> and that costs you $4. That seems silly. I realize that there are costs into the infrastructure, like someone has to pay for that machine to be there. Somebody has to upkeep that machine to be there. Somebody has to insure that machine because somebody might drive a truck into it and steal it and all the money that's inside of it. I mean, those things are, are possible. But if you look at the world like an interconnected grid and basically if the nodes on the grid can exchange money simply because they want to and there's an infrastructure to do that that allows you to move money at a really low cost, Again, I think it could be really valuable. I think that the cost of identity fraud and the fact that so many people have to deal with it is absolutely unacceptable. I don't believe that if we are participating in exchanges, we should for any reason have to expose ourselves to this underworld of crap just because we want to acquire things. Technology is better than that. And I think that Dwala has a big advantage that we actually have the capability to cheat in a really big way. We don't have X years of legacy costs and systems that we need to replace, we can actually start looking at the latest and the greatest, and we can start saying, well, this is the way to do it starting over. We actually get to blow the system up theoretically or philosophically and start over from scratch. And that is not an opportunity that I don't think has ever really existed in the payments market. And I think that we've been fortunate enough to be able to concentrate on a low enough kind of part of the stack as it relates to bank to bank, not reseller to reseller or gateway to gateway. And again, there's nothing wrong with those things. They provide a lot of value to a lot of people. But if you could reduce the interchange and serve all of those people the same, give a whole bunch of money back to people and release it into the economy, it could be very powerful. And I think that the way that we kind of look at the world is that there's nothing actually wrong with the banking system in some ways. So there's a lot of things people can probably give um, banks a lot of crap for. But I personally believe banks are where your money should be held. They already have a structure for protecting it. They already have a history for doing it. And even when banks kind of act poorly, there's already an existing infrastructure for rolling over and protecting your assets. I don't think that any kind of non-bank network should take over a, banking, a bank's role. I think that um, banks have a, a huge role in kind of whatever is next, and the money should stay with them. Um, we concentrate really heavily on the network value and retaining value inside of the transaction. Um, we believe the untapped potential is in web services in a really big way, especially with financial institutions. Um, you know, the existing ACH system um, is unbelievably reliable. It always works, which is amazing. You can actually submit a file in some sort of batch format and assume it's correct and assume that those transactions will go through if you don't hear anything back. Nothing else in our life really works like that, um, which is a huge kudos to the way that system operates. But I also believe that it shouldn't take three to five days for money to process. And inside of any existing batch system, we're not going to be able to get there. So we look at it like, how can I, how can I tweet? And then how can within... I mean, it's not even a second. In less than a second, how can that money come out of my actual bank account? And I'm talking about a promise. How many people have merchants ac merchant accounts in the room? How many people ever have? Okay, I'm gonna try to like widen the net. How many people know how long it takes to get paid through a merchant account once you charge a credit card? Okay, a little bit more. So for those that don't, it takes you maybe sometimes next day, sometimes up to seven days, depending on service. Sometimes longer if you're high risk. So even if the behavior that triggers the transaction is a card, the second that thing goes through, that money should be in your bank account. You shouldn't know how much was charged, which is a real-time promise. It should just move, and it should go in your bank account. Then you should be able to pay your employees. And there's no existing infrastructure to do that. Well, I'm fortunate enough that I work at a company with a bunch of brilliant people who already built that. 
It already exists, it's just our job now to distribute it and basically get it out into the marketplace to make everybody's life better. And I do believe that we can do that. I think that there is a unique opportunity to actually make people give a shit about payments. Like, it creates so much heartache the way we actually do it today that if you are ever inspired enough to be able to choose to pay a different way or choose to recognize what the problem is with the stream that's going on behind what you're acquiring, that there's an interesting opportunity to actually change behavior. Um, I don't know if we'll be successful at it, but we're certainly gonna try. And we think that the transition of payments, not necessarily to mobile, but to the internet, to any internet connected device, anywhere and everywhere, represents a huge shift in the way we're gonna exchange value in the future. So again, does anyone not understand about how Dwala thinks bank to bank? <laughs> Good, I feel like, all right, I got my point across today. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I think that mobile phones and things like m-commerce and the transition to them is already very heavily upon us. I mean, I think that it might not be um, a day soon when everybody goes and pays for their gas with their phone, but you know, I ask questions like, how many people have ever bought anything on Amazon, eBay, or Etsy on their phone? How many people have ever put their credit card number in a phone, right? The fact that there's even people in this room that have done that is a really, really big deal for the market in general. And 10 years ago, obviously, that never would have happened. And 30 years before that, if I asked the question, how many people have a plastic card in their pocket that they can go swipe at a coffee shop and get their coffee? Obviously, the answer would have been very different. And I think the shift from kind of terminals to GPS and um, you know, web services from batch is gonna cause a huge tidal wave in the payments business, um, which is going to change the way trillions, if not hundreds of trillions of dollars moves in a short period of time. And we're working very hard to be a part of that and creating value um, regardless of where we kind of show up in the stack. So my Twitter handle is BP Milne. I would encourage you to um, be combative, challenge anything I said. Um, I would really enjoy a conversation with anybody who wants to geek out and have a conversation about payments, even if you don't agree with me. Um, and that's really the end of what I have to say. Um, I really enjoyed my time. Thank you very much, guys.